Hey folks, Andy Patton here, joined today by Caroline Fenton, the host of Locked on LSU. Caroline and I are going to break down Efton Reed's game and his fit at Gonzaga, all right here on the Locked on Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. And I am thrilled to be joined today by Caroline Fenton. Caroline is the host of the Locked On LSU podcast, the perfect person to give us some analysis on Gonzaga's newest member of the front court, Efton Reed. Caroline, thank you for coming on to the show. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And let me start by saying, y'all are getting a good one. <laughs> well, we're, I, we're, I think a lot of Gonzaga fans, to be honest, are just happy we're getting somebody. It was a really slow start to the offseason. And after losing early, early for Gonzaga standards in the Sweet 16, and then seeing a lot of their primary targets go to Auburn, like Johnny Broom, or go to Texas Tech, like Dawes Amac, I think fans were starting to get a little restless that the transfer portal was not going to fall in their favor this year. But we'd heard rumblings about Efton Reed for a couple of weeks that he was somebody that Gonzaga was interested coming out of high school. Obviously, he went to LSU, entered the portal. So I'm really, really glad, not just that he's coming to Gonzaga because I think he's going to be fantastic, but just that there is somebody joining the front court. So we're not going to be completely barren up there. Uh, not going to have as many fans who are very concerned that Gonzaga's window is starting to close. I think having Reed in the picture is is definitely going to quell some of those concerns. Uh, I want to start, Caroline, by just asking for just kind of a, a bit of an overview on just what kind of player Reed is. What are some key things that maybe people who maybe watched one or two LSU games this season might might not know about Reed? Well, I think first and foremost, when you talk about Efton Reed, is you just look at his size. I mean, he is a big man, seven feet tall, and he's able to use his size to his advantage. Now, when Efton Reed committed to LSU, I think myself and a lot of other LSU fans included thought, you know, this is perfect. You know, mm-hmm. this is the perfect addition. This was kind of the last hole that needed to be filled in Will Wade's roster. And we thought, what better than Efton Reed, you know, uh, like the number three center in the in the country, the number 27 prospect in the country, a five-star mm-hmm. recruit. We thought that he was going to come in here and kind of just be that missing piece that Will Wade had needed, to com- needed to complete a roster to even, you know, make a run in the mm-hmm. NCAA tournament. Because, here at LSU, basketball standards are a little bit different than over at Gonzaga, but yeah. we're really excited about the addition of Efton Reed. Mm-hmm. And I think that what came to fruition at LSU, the expectations weren't necessarily met. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that was necessarily by the fault of Efton Reed, rather mm-hmm. than just the fault of, of a system that didn't necessarily fit his needs. Mm-hmm. Because I do think that Efton Reed came into LSU needing a little bit of refining. Mm-hmm. I think he came to LSU needing just a, a, a little bit of kind of rubbing the, the rough edges yeah. around his game. And LSU just wasn't the best fit. Uh, for that. I mean, you look at his stats, you know, average six and a half points a game, four and a half rebounds, 52% from the field. I mean, that, that's not, those aren't stellar stats. You know, those mm-hmm. aren't numbers that you see on a box score that just jump off to you. But mm-hmm. what the biggest thing that I saw about Efton Reed that makes me think that he's going to flourish at Gonzaga is that we saw flashes mm-hmm. of what Efton Reed can do and who Efton Reed can be. Um, you know, I advise Gonzaga fans, if you're looking to kind of see what Efton Reed can be, look at the LSU-Missouri game and the SEC tournament. I mean, Efton Reed just was an absolute star in that game and really kind of carried LSU to that victory against Missouri. So, I think with Efton Reed, what you're getting is a really talented player. You're getting some things that just can't be coached. I mean, size, first and foremost, being one of them, just being such a huge presence on the course, you know, on, on the court, you know, no pun intended, um, because he is huge. Um, but also knowing that it might be a little bit of a project, knowing that, you know, mm-hmm. coming into Gonzaga, he may not be that five-star caliber recruit that you would expect to see coming into Gonzaga. He may need a little bit of refining. Um, mm-hmm. He's not a complete product yet but he's a really good player and that he has a lot of heart into it as well. 
Well, you brought up a great point about the stats because I think a lot of people, like I said, who who maybe maybe didn't watch LSU at all or maybe only watched one game, they're going to look at the numbers and they're going to see, okay, this guy, six and a half points, four and a half rebounds. Uh, but he started every single game. He played like 20 minutes per night. And so I think some people might take away like, well, he, he didn't meet expectations. He wasn't as good as he should have been. For me, my takeaway was, yeah, LSU maybe didn't meet the expectations as a team that they should have met. But we're talking about a, a good SEC team, 21 wins, uh, had a front court player who's going to be probably a lottery pick or a first round pick in Tari Eason. And yet we're talking about a guy who played every single game and started every single game. Like, obviously there was a lot of value there and there was the, the team and the coach, Will Wade, they, they felt that he was contributing to this team. And, you know, yeah, maybe he should have been in more of a, a limited role. Maybe he should have been coming off the bench. I don't know all of the specifics there, but that's what makes Gonzaga such an interesting fit for him is we don't know what's going on with Drew Timmy. That's still up in the air at this point. He's in my mind, 50, 50, 50, pretty much on whether he's coming back or not. So if he, if he returns, then Reed can be in a little bit more of a kind of a, he's got a safety net. He doesn't have to be the guy. He's not having the weight of expectations of a top 10 team on his shoulder. If it doesn't return, then it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge for, for Reed necessarily. But I think looking at those numbers don't necessarily paint the full picture. Uh, and I think we're talking about a guy who, who realistically probably is going to come to Gonzaga to do a little bit of developing. And I think you look at Gonzaga's history in that regard and Brandon Clark, who just, you know, got votes for sixth man of the year in the NBA today, and he transferred to Gonzaga and sat out a year. And so I think there's some potential for him to develop. And I'm curious, you know, you kind of touched on it already, but uh, he's maybe not a finished product and that's okay. But what are some things that maybe you think Gonzaga could do to kind of help him get to that point where, where he could be a legitimate star? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you know, offensively is is where his greatest weaknesses lie. And if you look at that LSU team as a whole, that's where the entire weaknesses were. I mean, this was the top defense in the SEC. It was a top mm -hmm. 10 defense in college basketball. And and offensively, in Ken Palm ratings, LSU had one of the worst offenses in college basketball. I mean, the team was sloppy. The team was very penalty prone. The team mm -hmm. had a ton of turnovers and offensively just couldn't really get things going. And although they could make the stops and they could stop shots at the rim, when it, whenever you turn the ball over that much, you're going to lose games. I think that Efton Reed is almost like a microcosm for this LSU team as a whole mm -hmm. because he was incredibly turnover prone. He led the SECs, the SEC in fouls this past year. So he drew a ton of fouls. He also mm -hmm. turned the ball over a lot. He's a little bit iffy offensively. I think working and fine tuning on that jumper mm -hmm. is really going to help him out. I think one thing that also helps him out a lot is he's going to be dexterous. I mean, mm -hmm. he can work from the right side as well as the left side. You mentioned Tari Eason for LSU. He was one player that one of my biggest kind of critiques of him was mm -hmm. he was so right side dependent. You could, if you, mm -hmm. if you got forced over that left side, I mean, he couldn't really do anything offensively. So I think one great thing about Efton Reed is he has, you know, kind of that foundation of being able to really flourish on both sides of the ball, right and left side of the court. Um, and I think just coming from such a very talented defensive team, that's where his 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 strengths really lie here. And you mentioned Drew Timmy. If Drew Timmy doesn't come back to Gonzaga, I think that Efton Reed will be able to come in and absolutely contribute defensively, even mm -hmm. though that offense that offensive game kind of needs some fine tuning. Um, mm -hmm. That defensive element is absolutely there as well. Well, and that's that's a perfect segue because that's exactly what I want to talk about more in the second segment is how does he fit defensively? What could that look like with or without Drew Timmy? Uh, but before we get there, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. Summer is coming. And with summer, you're going to need some food on the go. Built Bars are the perfect snack to take with you on family vacations. Throw them in your bags, in your kids' backpacks. Make sure that everyone has a bar so you are fueled for your summer adventures. The best part about Built Bars, they're healthy and delicious. No more sacrificing delicious food for health. With Built Bar, you can have both. Have you tried the Built Puffs yet? We are going crazy for the puffs. They come in crazy flavors like banana cream pie and even churro. Who doesn't want a protein bar that tastes like a churro? And they're only 140 calories. Sign me up. If that's not enough flavor for you, then you might want to try the Mixed Box. The Mixed Box, com box comes with 12 flavors of bars and puffs. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Go to Built.com to get all of your favorites. Banana cream pie, raspberry, double chocolate, and so many more. They are all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. Check them out at Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15, and you will get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. 
All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still joined by Caroline Fenton of Locked On LSU. And we're still chatting all things Efton Reed. The Zags finally got themselves a big man heading into next season. We talked a little bit about who he is offensively, some challenges with the jump shot, uh, kind of like you said, a microcosm of the whole LSU team, which I love that because I think it does kind of tell the story of how their season went. Uh, but now I want to focus on the defense, uh, an element that was very good for the entire LSU team and certainly a big part of who Reed was as a player. Uh, he's probably not going to be Chet Holmgren. That's obviously the, the unfair baseline that Gonzaga fans are going to use going forward because Chet Holmgren was such an elite rim protector and elite overall defensive player. But what do you think are his current strengths on the defensive end of the floor and maybe some areas where he could continue to grow at Gonzaga? Yeah, I think one thing is his, I mean, I mentioned his size, and I think that very much so helps him at the rim the mm -hmm. most. I mean, his rebounding ability, I think, is is his greatest strength defensively, just because he is such a large body guy. And not mm -hmm. only that, is he's incredibly agile. Mm -hmm. And I say that and kind of transition into one thing that he could work on is his yeah. speed. Since he yeah. is, he's incredibly smooth on the court, and he's able to kind of get in those tight areas, able to get up to the rim. I think that one area where we saw him lack was he, he gets, he gets a little slow. It can, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit uh, difficult to kind of keep up in transition. So I think that's one area to work on is, you know, while he's incredibly agile, the agility is there, the speed is kind of lacking. So I think that's one area that they can can kind of focus on defensively. Um, but I think that's, that's really what you're getting out of him. You know, if... If he comes in and you want him to contribute immediately, that's where he's going to be able to shine mm -hmm. is on the defensive side of the ball, just getting up to the rim and being a really physical presence at the rim and being able to rebound. The physicality was exactly what I wanted to talk about in the second point because it's been a, a oft-utilized criticism of Gonzaga, of their mm -hmm. program in general, certainly of how they perform in the NCAA tournament because they don't face a lot of physicality during the regular season. And while Gonzaga fans very much like to push back on this narrative uh, that it hurts Gonzaga and seven straight Sweet 16s kind of point to the fact that it probably doesn't hurt them all that much. Uh, at the end of the day, they play a less physical schedule from January to early March than a lot of other teams in Power 5 conferences. There is zero doubt about that. Uh, Efton Reed is going to come to Gonzaga with the experience of going through the SEC playing, again, 34 games, 20 minutes per night. He played a lot of tough mm -hmm. games against tough dudes. He played against Walker Kessler and Jabari Smith at Auburn. As an example, Florida had some good bigs. Like He, he has had to play physical defense against the caliber of opponents that Gonzaga will face in the non-conference and they will face in the tournament, but not during the regular season. I'm curious your thoughts on just how much that physicality that he has already kind of embraced, already had in his bag for his first season, how much that's going to help him entering his second season and throughout his career at Gonzaga. Yeah, I mean, the SEC is a grind. And I think more so this year than any year in the past, it was so incredibly top heavy. You look at Auburn, Arkansas, Tennessee, Florida, mm -hmm. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're facing really good and physical teams mm -hmm. week in and week out. And you mentioned it. I mean, he started in every game for LSU this past season. And what's your best ability? It's your availability. Yeah. And LSU has been dealing with, dealt with injuries this entire season. And that's when you really kind of saw a big dip in LSU's production was when Xavier Pinson, for example, was in and out of the lineup with injury. Tari Eason dealing with an injury, you know, kept, in, kept him off, um, off the court for a few games here and there. But Efton Reed was our one constant. And although, you know, we saw a little bit of a dip in the, in the win column for LSU, whenever they do, were dealing with injuries, whenever you're going through such a, a difficult schedule, such as the brunt of the SEC schedule, I mean, nobody's 100%. Nobody's team is 100%, and not every player is going to be 100%. You know, you're going to get dinged up here and there. You're going to have an, an ankle issue. You're going to have a knee thing that's messing with you. But I think that's one thing with Efton Reed is he was able to remain durable during such a difficult brunt of a physical SEC schedule. So that absolutely is is kind of a feather in his cap. Um, and I think just the, you know, I mentioned the speed. There was a point in this season when I just thought the style of Will Wade's play, it's just, it's, it's, you can't maintain it. I mean, it was full court press after full court press. It was incredibly physical play. That was Will Wade's style. That's how he wanted to win games. But I got to a certain point in the season where I was like, these guys just can't keep up. Yeah. And so I think that maybe, you know, 
transitioning into a different style um, and the way that Gonzaga plays. It's it's not a full court press on every mm-hmm. single possession. Um, mm-hmm. That's absolutely going to help Efton Reed's. You know, he, he has the durability, but I think that may be able to work on his speed as well as just being able to, you know, not be full court pressing yeah. up and down the court on every mm-hmm. single play. Well, and, and obviously not playing against that gauntlet of, of guys every single game, too. You know, I mean, Gonzaga had very few losses last year. Two of them were to Arkansas and Alabama teams that Efton Reed, you know, is familiar with. He played against mm-hmm. them a handful of times last year. Uh, I know that I did watch the LSU-Arkansas game, and Jalen Williams had a monster game against LSU. He also had a monster game against Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament. So, again, that was a kind of- talented team. Yes. I mean, I think a lot of a, a lot of basketball fans may look at the SEC and like kind of mm-hmm. you know say oh, it's a football conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the most part, I would probably agree. But this past yeah. year, it yeah. was so competitive; it was almost like cannibalistic in the SEC yeah. because the good teams were just beating up on the other good teams. Um, and LSU was able to hang for the most part. Definitely wasn't in that top tier of SEC play, um, but just going through the brunt of that schedule, it's tough, man. It is tough. Absolutely. And I think, too, I mean, like for a guy like Reed to, to have that experience, to have gone up mm-hmm. against, you know, Charles Bediaco at Alabama or Jalen Williams at Arkansas or again, Kessler and Smith at, at, at Auburn. And yeah, Sheepway, uh, Kentucky. Sheepway, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a lot of that's a lot of really talented big men. That yeah, that's that's NBA talent that you're facing week in and week out there. Every single one of those guys, most likely, or most of them. So, and heck, you got to go up against Tari Eason every day in practice. Like that kind of stuff helps you out too. So, uh, I'm really excited to see what kind of impact he can make uh, defensively. I think just looking at at the, the the stylistic thing is interesting to me too because Gonzaga certainly doesn't play that that press style defense mm-hmm. all that often, and they do utilize a lot of half court traps. But the player they use there is Anton Watson, and he's going to be back next year and he's going to be utilized in that role they're not going to ask reed to come away from the rim for that so i think he's going to be in a better suited situation defensively we're going to pivot back to offense i know we've been pinballing um but gonzaga runs a lot on offense and you mentioned the speed being something as as a bit of a question mark for reed i think if drew timmy returns which again still unsure on that and he's he's probably not gonna be asked to play more than 20 to 25 minutes per game like he did at LSU. Do you think he's going to be able to kind of handle that even if Gonzaga's getting out in transition offensively as frequently? I mean, they were the number two team in the country last year behind Purdue uh, and just pace. Uh, so that's going to be something that they're going to try to do again this next season. Yeah, I think that pace is absolutely going to be maybe a hurdle that he may have to to get over. But mm-hmm. I think just offering him space is something yeah. that he didn't get at LSU that I think Gonzaga would provide him so yeah. well, is just providing him that space. I mean, you mentioned it, you mentioned Taurus and Darius mm-hmm. Days, two of these guys that were kind of like the the big men up front at LSU. Those guys were getting the ball. Taurus and I think we saw in that Missouri game Whenever he got those opportunities, I mean, he was explosive. And he, that's when he was able to contribute very much so. So I think allowing that space on the court is going to be it, it, crucial for his growth um, at Gonzaga. All right, Caroline, thank you so much for all of this. This is a great primer for, for fans to talk about at Afton Reed. We're going to come back in the third segment. We're going to look even more at Reed's fit with Gonzaga. We're going to talk a little bit about his NBA future. And we're going to talk a little bit about the transfer portal because it has been complete madness so far this season and very few teams have been exper- have experienced it more than LSU. We're going to come back. We're going to talk more about that. But before we get there, let's talk about rockauto.com. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Plus, Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you could need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpets. I just had my 13-year-old car serviced recently, and I can tell you having one place to find all the parts I need makes things infinitely easier. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box, so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still chatting about Efton Reed with the locked on LSU host, Caroline Fenton. Caroline, 
excellent conversation so far. I hope Gonzaga fans are hearing this and are even more excited about what they're going to get out of Reed. One question that I wanted to ask you, kind of piggybacking on what we were just talking about on the offensive usage, one of the sets that Gonzaga has utilized a ton and they used it nearly to death last year with Chet Holmgren and Drew Timmy is the high-low offense where they put one of the bigs at the top of the key, one of the bigs down low kind of have that spacing ability where it, it creates an opportunity for the guy down low to get some space to operate. Mm -hmm. Drew Timmy obviously was extraordinary at that. That's what he's been good at for the last three years. If he returns, I expect they're going to want to use him in a similar role. So my question there, Reed, 25% you know, three-point shooter, 48% free throw shooter. So the numbers do not paint him as a guy who can necessarily step away from the rim. I think the tape and the high school tape certainly indicate maybe that's not entirely true. I'm curious if you think Gonzaga attempts to utilize him in that role where he's playing a little bit more away from the basket. If you think that's something he's capable of doing, or if that's maybe a few years down the road, if it's something he ends up being able to do. I'll preface it with this. It's absolutely something that he's capable to do. And I'll kind of go back to what I said in the first segment and that he didn't necessarily meet LSU's expectations mm -hmm. and it wasn't at fault of his own entirely. I think it was also, he was just a victim of the system mm -hmm. because like you mentioned, the high school tape, I mean, the three point shooting is there, mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily there at LSU. That I think was one of my, my, my biggest takeaways from um, from Efton Reed in his time at LSU was he's the three-point shooting wasn't there but also like I said microcosm of LSU as a whole three-point yeah. shooting was all over the place for that entire team I mean mm -hmm. one game they'll be draining threes left and right and then the other they can't seem to make a basket yeah. I think I saw the inconsistency of Efton Reed's shooting as a result of just this is a, a a bad offense. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, yeah, yeah. LSU basketball had a yeah. very bad offense. And I think mm -hmm. Efton Reed being a young player um, and also kind of in line behind a lot of other, you know, very talented players on this roster as well, just mm -hmm. didn't give him the opportunity to do that. I do think that his three-point shooting, he may have picked up a few bad habits. And I think that it does need to be fine-tuned very much so. It's not going to be something that I believe that he can come in and start, you know, turn it around immediately and contribute immediately. But it's there. That's, that's I think, the most frustrating thing with me, with Efton Reed's experience at LSU, was it was all there. Yeah. It just wasn't unlocked in this system. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Gonzaga has this very lengthy history, mostly with guards, not as much with big men, of getting the guards to be more efficient shooters when they come to Gonzaga. And, and it's mostly, it's not that they have like a magical potion for helping these guys. It's that the system just allows them to be more efficient. They're also mm -hmm. coming to a system where they're not asked to be you know, the primary ball handler. Rasir Bolton last year is a great example. He shot 46% from three. He was like 32% at Iowa State, but that's because he was always guarded by the other team's best player. He was the focal point of opposing defenses, and that wasn't the case at Gonzaga. So mm -hmm. Reed, while he was not the focal point of opposing defenses at LSU, that's kind of where I'm curious if just a system change is, is going to be enough for him to kind of unlock some of that potential efficiency even around the rim and potentially away from the rim as well. And it seems like you're thinking that with some, with some fine tuning, a little bit of, you know, uh, sanding around the edges, that that's probably a situation that could come true for Gonzaga fans and Efton Reed. Absolutely. Like very much so. And mm -hmm. I look at Efton Reed and he has NBA talent. He has NBA size. All of the potential is there. And when I saw yeah. that he was transferring to Gonzaga, my first thought was, that's that's the place that's going to be able to develop him into an yeah. NBA caliber player mm -hmm. because it's all there. It all exists. We just didn't see it at LSU. Was it the system? Was it the coaching staff? Was it the distractions? Was it the fact that he was just behind a long list of other very talented players as well? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those things included, I think that being in this Gonzaga system, like you said, that has a history of being able to just unlock something that wasn't there before, maybe that was there that hadn't been discovered yet. And I think that Efton Reed absolutely is going to be able to blossom just in a new system and under a coaching staff that's really able to kind of identify some of these offensive woes that he was facing at LSU and be able to say, okay, here are some things that you can tweak here and there. Because as I'm sure plenty of your listeners know, LSU has been facing plenty of distractions yes. off the court. And yeah. I think just a fresh start, new slate, and a new coaching staff is going to be exactly what Efton Reed needs to be able to fine-tune what I think we all know is there. What I saw throughout his time at LSU, clearly what scouts saw as a five-star recruit coming out of high school, it's all there. It just needs to be kind of 
unburied a little bit. Absolutely. Well, Gonzaga has done this before. This is not their first foray into this. So I think uh, the optimism is very real around what Efton Reed is capable of being. Even what he already is, is pretty dang good and is going to be very helpful with no Chet Holmgren, with potentially no Drew Timmy next year. I'm, I'm very excited to see what he can add. I want to switch gears a little bit, and you touched on it a little bit there, uh, about just the offseason in general. Gonzaga and LSU have had very, very, very different uh, college basketball off seasons. Obviously, uh, LSU, the Will Wade situation has been a very challenging one. We saw, uh, you can, you know more than me, how many players transferred, but it was a lot. It was a good, good chunk of that team. Uh, All that but had- two scholarship players who entered the transfer portal and decided to come back. Wow. All yeah, but it- two. All of them at one point had decided to enter the transfer portal, and then mm-hmm. all but two actually did transfer out. So it's well, been it's been a wild couple of months. I'll tell you that. Yeah, not no doubt, and even with the football program, there's been a lot of interesting stuff going on over there. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, with the transfer portal. Obvi- obviously, the reasoning that this is happening is is because of coaching change. So it's it's a bit hard to kind of get a sense of how common this kind of behavior is going to be. Going forward, when you actually have an established coach, when they're not, you know, getting fired and, and leaving. So I'm curious, though, just your thoughts in general on on what has been. I mean, obviously, you know, with Miami and the situation that's going on there with Isaiah Wong and, and his kind of uh, proclamation that he wanted to have a bigger pay raise because of his performance on the court, which is not technically what NIL is supposed to be, but is what it has become. Uh, I'm just curious as somebody, you know, at a very different type of school, obviously a football program, big budget university. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts on how this has shaken out so far and maybe what things may or may not need to be adjusted for this to continue to to function normally going forward? Yeah, I mean, the thing with LSU, it's, it's crazy because it's not just a coaching change. And whenever mm-hmm. I, I see players entering the transfer portal in the middle of a coaching change, I don't hold it against them in the slightest because yeah. I get it. They want to be with a coach that recruited them. They may want a fresh start, whatever it may be. And LSU is not just facing a coaching change in terms of basketball, I mean, mm-hmm. they could be starting on the barrel of some really serious NCAA yeah. violations. Yeah. Um, it could mean a postseason ban. And yeah. especially when these players are coming into college for a year, maybe to absolute mm-hmm. maximum, that's where they get noticed is in March, is in the yeah. postseason. They want to be able to compete for a championship. Um, so that mass exodus out of Baton Rouge, you know, I don't blame these players whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But I think the really fascinating thing has been is Matt McMahon hired at LSU from Murray State. Yeah. I mean, he, you saw a mass exodus from Murray State coming yep. into LSU. So yeah. I think that, you know, you kind of ha- – I'm almost conflicted because I'm really nervous about yeah. what the NCAA is going to say, what the what the, the violations may or may not be. Is it a postseason mm-hmm. ban? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that's the fun thing about the NCAA is there's no consistency. <laughs> there's no timeline. It's just yeah. like – you just pull a punishment out of a, out of their hat yep. whenever they feel like it. Um, and then the other side of it is, you know, being – and what I feel like is in very good hands in terms of you seeing so many players from Murray State coming to LSU, wanting to follow their coach, seeing so many high school recruits committing to that man in the LSU program, even with the uncertainty of the future. Um, so that kind of makes me feel good about it. So I'm very conflicted in terms yeah. of, of LSU basketball at the moment. But I think in terms of transfer portal and NIL as a whole, mm-hmm. um, you know – this term is thrown around a lot about the wild, wild west, but that's exactly what we're living in with NIL is there yeah. are no regulations. There is no cap. And yeah. the the Supreme Court made that very clear that they don't want there to be They're like yeah. You can't have a cap and you can't really regulate it very much. But state each state is regulating it differently. So I think, you know, alternate, you know, in my LSU terms, Texas A&M, for example, is, you know, their boosters, you know, their oil boosters are offering millions and millions and millions of dollars to their football recruits. And, you know, you may be looking at Vanderbilt, on the other hand, in the SEC, that don't have alums that are willing to dish out the same amount of cash to the football program, and maybe some other bigger football programs. So, and I think you can relate to basketball as well, is, you know, there is so much inconsistency and it's so uneven. And I do think that we'll be coming down the pipe of um, some sort of, you know, blanket statement with NIL where yeah. each state approaches it the same way. Um, yeah. But it's I, it's really turned into something so wild. I, I saw a piece put out by Ross Dellinger earlier today from yeah. Sports Illustrated. And it's a really interesting article mm-hmm. um, talking about the future of NIL and the way that kind of these, these school boards have looked at it. Like, no, this is just you writing a check. This is not, you know, a player mm-hmm. benefiting from the name image and likeness. It really is 
wild the way that it's all turned out. I mean, I think it's a good thing. Overall, it's a good thing. Players should be benefiting off their new image and likenesses, but I, do, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a little bit of regulation of both the transfer portal and NFL um, coming down the pipe here. Absolutely. You're, I mean, it's capitalism. Like who, the, the student athletes are making millions upon millions upon millions of dollars for their university, even at smaller yeah. schools, even at mid-major programs like like non-Gonzaga mid-major programs. Uh, and so it makes some sense for them to get paid, but it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Certainly, I know uh, Gonzaga fans, uh, Efton Reed has made them less nervous, but there was a lot of nerves about like, are we getting priced out? Is that what's happening? Like, are we unable to quote unquote afford guys like Daz Amak or Johnny Broom that the transfer to, you know, went other places. And I don't think that that's true. And I think Gonzaga is probably going to be okay because of the brand, because of the coaching staff, because of their success churning out NBA talent and, and things like that. But I, I like some of Gonzaga's competition in the WCC, like, this could bury them. Like I would be pretty worried about like San Francisco, obviously they're, they lost their entire team because Todd Golden took the job at Florida uh, and they're pro probably the same thing that's happening at LSU. I don't have any inside information on this for people listening, but I wouldn't be surprised if in a few weeks we hear that Khalil Shabazz, who was USF's second best player last year, he entered the transfer portal recently. That's probably where he's going. Like that's, <laughs> that's going to be my guess there. Um, and so some of that stuff is happening because of that, but like is USF going to be able to get, you know, how are they going to be able to compete when they don't have that kind of budget? And it'll just be interesting to see how it shakes out. I, I think, again, I think Gonzaga is above the fray a little bit in that regard, but it is definitely, like you said, the comparison between, you know, what a &M can do and what Vanderbilt can do, but also the comparison between what those schools can do and what, you know, a Murray State can do or mm -hmm. USF can do or University of Portland, like schools like that. So I'm very curious how it's going to shake out. But The big uh, get bigger. Yes. That's kind of how I'm seeing it pan yeah. out with NIL. But also I, I look at Jackson State, for example. Yes. There was a five-star wide receiver quarterback. I can't remember what position he played. But he was originally committed to Alabama and then mm -hmm. flipped to Jackson State because he yeah. got this multi-million dollar NIL deal. So while I totally agree with you, I mm -hmm. worry about these smaller programs that can't dish out the millions and millions of dollars that mm -hmm. it would take to maybe bring in an Efton Reed type of player. But mm -hmm. also... I mean, I think that players are committing to smaller schools because mm -hmm. of the money if they're able to come up with it. So it's a, it's a weird little dichotomy there. I think also, too, I, I spoke with Tobias, ba Tobias Bass on an episode yesterday, and he was talking about a similar uh, situation where players who are maybe getting recruited by some of those Power 5 schools but are like – the power five schools are maybe waffling because, well, we might just add a kid from the portal or, you know, you, you, you'll come here, but we're not going to guarantee you any money or anything like that. So those kids are like, well, if I can transfer penalty free, I'm just going to go to the example he used was like, I'm not going to go to Georgia. So I'm just going to go to Georgia state and I'm going to go ball out at Georgia state for a year. And then I might transfer. And he mentioned without saying any names that there are coaches who are like, <laughs> basically recruiting high schoolers that way by saying, come here, if you ball out, you can leave and you can go somewhere else, which is probably not in the spirit of how this is supposed to work, but you've got it. Like if you're a smaller school, like that's kind of the, the route, like that's the best way to go to get some talent. So it'll be really interesting to see how it shakes out. Uh, and obviously LSU and Gonzaga is such different programs, but I think we'll be interesting to see how, how those kind of programs handle this going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that Gonzaga has the brand Yes. And, you know, everyone knows Gonzaga football. When, or, excuse me, basketball. <laughs> Nobody knows Gonzaga football. No, um, <laughs> and when it comes March, I mean, I, I think March Madness and Gonzaga just come hand in hand. Yep. And knowing that brand and, you know, Drew Timmy being an, a national face that everyone recognizes in terms of college basketball and just mm -hmm. sports as a whole, Gonzaga will be safe. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just the transfer portal is – it's wild. And it, it's almost like – you don't get rewarded for sitting on the bench anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you if you don't if you don't start immediately, you go somewhere mm -hmm. else where you will start. Yep. And I don't I don't want to punish any player for doing that, for wanting to start, for wanting yep. to be able to get their shot at a mm -hmm. professional uh, in whatever sport it might be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at the Heisman Trophy winners. I know I keep relating it back to football, but that's you know, People LSU and LSU. Too, don't worry. <laughs> but I, I look at some of the past Heisman Trophy winners and, you know, you look at Baker Mayfield who transferred and then won a Heisman Trophy. You look at Kyler Murray who transferred to Oklahoma and won a Heisman Trophy. Mm -hmm. Joe Burrow transferred from Ohio State to LSU and won a Heisman Trophy. Sometimes mm -hmm. your best opportunity lies elsewhere. And that's okay. The place that you committed to when you were 16, 17 years old may not be where you find, you know, the most success when you're 20, 21, 22. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it is almost like, 
the wild, wild west. You can go and do wherever, go wherever you want, do whatever you want and make however much money people are willing to pay you. Absolutely. Caroline, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for talking Efton Reed. I'm hoping that Gonzaga fans are feeling really, really good about adding him to the team. Before I let you go, can you let people know where they can follow you if they're interested in learning more about LSU sports? Yes, you can find me locked on LSU. We're on your preferred podcast platform, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, whatever it may be. You can also check us on, on YouTube, Locked on LSU, and you can follow me on Twitter at Caroline Fenton one Thank you again, Caroline, for joining me today. That is going to do it. We got one more player season in review episode coming later this week, and then we're going to take a look at Gonzaga's baseball program, among other things, on Friday's show right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, like Locked On LSU, also available wherever you get podcasts and available on YouTube as well. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.